I will speak for myself. <laughs> Kathy and I just decided to switch. Because apparently what she's going to talk about is relevant to what I was just saying. rather than design, we've come by myself to a complete synergy of topics briefly, so it made sense for me to follow on. Um, Oh yeah, sorry. Sorry. Okay. So this is a Mike. This is a slightly heterogeneous lecture. So at the end of yesterday's lecture, I'd got to the end, in a way, of a story of um, numerical simulations. And I had another, a number of other topics I thought I might touch on. And I discussed it with Mike and said, you know, what should I talk about in a kind of sort of flexible lecture? So we picked out a, a few topics and put them together. But they, you know, they're, they're a bit disparate. Hopefully, there'll be something here to interest everybody. Um, Everything I was saying yesterday um, and the day before was about generic cluster modelling. And I just wanted to move on to something that might be of more interest to observers, which is to what extent it's meaningful and helpful to try and construct detailed dynamical models of given observed regions. And so this is the, the synergy with what Bob's just been talking about. I mean, given these new results on Orion, you know, what should modellers be doing? So that's the first third. Then um, the... What imprint is there on the population of stars in the field of the fact that they were born in a cluster or not? And how does that depend on the richness of the cluster they came from? Already that's been discussed tangentially when I talked about binary populations and how they reflect the richness of the cluster that they were born in. For example, we talked yesterday about creating wide binaries in cluster dispersal and how the efficiency of that depends on the end of the cluster. We also talked about pruning down the binary distribution by interactions and dense cores, and that depends on the richness of the cluster. I won't be talking about that again, but just bear in mind, binaries are probably one of the best smoking guns for deciding whether a star formed in a cluster or not. Um, and then, getting closer to home, what is the specific evidence in the case of the sun of where it came from? And I think, I think this is rather a fun topic, actually, this last one. So, um, modelling individual systems... There are not that many systems that have been modelled in detail, but perhaps people will be able to provide some, um, some more. But uh, the ones that I'm aware of, a lot of work's been done over the years by a number of groups on the ONC for the obvious reasons that it really is relatively nearby, very cluster-like in appearance, very well studied uh, observationally. Um, just a point I want to emphasise about when you do a simulation of a cluster where you've got data, there's no point in just simulating the cluster. You've always got to go into it with some precise question in mind, design a numerical experiment that answers a specific question. So as an example of this, here we were, uh, Elwin Scally and myself in the past, looking at uh, forming the ONC and saying, it's really pretty smooth now if you look at it on the sky. It's not a, a, a perfect king model, it's a bit squished, but it's not very clumpy. What constraints does that place on how clumpy it could have started out? So, you know, you put in lots of fractal distributions, lots of clumps, and see how easy it is to get it smooth by you know, two million year age of uh, the ONC. And the answer is it's terribly easy. So actually, it doesn't provide any, any constraints at all. Um, this very much uh, echoes uh, what Bob's been saying, that really our kinematic data is, however, rather limited and... Uh, What's really good in the ONC is that we do have a good census of the stellar content. And uh, here's the uh, 
latest uh, compilation um, by Dario et al. on the stellar content of the ONC came out very recently, so it's like a sort of update of Lynn Hillenbrandt's stellar census in the ONC. And rather remarkably, you see... Oh, you do? Okay, I'll point it to you. Right, so rather remarkably, you see, in fact, that the um, IMF is apparently in the ONC really deficient by about a factor of 10 in the brown dwarf regime relative to the, to the field. So that's a result that make me, you think. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the author is in the room, so I shall... <laughs> yeah, go, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, basically, the, the, the red line that you see above the, as you mentioned, the IMF is the, uh, that is the Chagrier uh, IMF. So, so it's actually Chagrier's representation yeah. of what he the thinks is in the field. The, sure, sure. No, no, of course, so Abs absolutely. Uh, very yeah. poor observational yeah. constraints on the field IMF, uh, that, those masses, and we rely on the clusters to tell us what it's really like. Right. So let's, this is That's a, Chagrier's opinion. Oh, I, 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 I agree, but I'm very glad you made that point. Yeah. That really yeah. matter what yeah. you yeah. If you look at the scale, yeah. uh, basically down in the brown dwarf regime on the left, uh, so the second and third point, there is more than one of the osmotic conditions. So you're uh, just saying that there is no field IMF yeah, ever measured there. there. Yeah. So yeah. there is nothing yeah. to compare it to. Yeah. But yeah. it's just the fitting of the log normal yeah. on the stellar side and then extrapolating yeah. it in yeah. a symmetric So a factor 100 would be fine because it's completely unconstrained exactly. from the field end. Yeah. Right. yeah. Well, that's. Uh, but I will just say this is also yeah. very brand new and yeah. somewhat controversial. It was news to me. I learned about it at dinner last night, so I just thought I would <laughs> <laughs> hand it to you. Uh, um, and the radial velocity measurements, which uh, Bob has just been discussing very nicely uh, there, the, um, the idea of the filament, and so... I was also reading this paper uh, last night, and um, to take the second point first, two problems is when you try and figure out from radial velocity measurements what's happening, or from kinematic data, what's happening. The point I made just now to uh, Rob, that the data with that gradient is matched by an inflowing system down the, the filament, so you've got a rugby ball which is homologously collapsing, that fits the data fine, that gives you the velocity gradient, which is observed. But, as I said, you could also flip the sign and have it expanding out, and that would also uh, uh, fit the, the data. Although I've just been having a little chat with uh, Bob about the fact that, whereas when something is actually collapsing under gravity in a stretched out system, you expect these very anisotropic velocities to develop if it's a elongated filament, but if you just have a relaxed cluster in the middle of the filament and then you lose the gas and it re-expands, it should re-expand isotropically, and that could well leave a different signature in the radial velocities from, from this. So I think there's more modelling to be done even on the scant data that you've got, which is after all only one component of the velocity, the velocity along your line of sight. I don't think quite th th it, all possibilities have yet been um, explored. And then the other problem that uh, Bob alluded to, and it's terribly acute in the case of Orion, is that Jones and Walker explicitly removed any possibility of expansion of the ONC in their proper motion analysis. So they actually deci decided they didn't know their plate scale at all, and they were going to derive the change in the plate scale from one epoch to the other by minimising the net expansion of the, of the, or setting to zero the net expansion of the system. And then they could measure dispersion around that. So, you know, pending Gaia, all you can do is run your numerical simulation and treat it just like Jones and Walker did and subtract out the mean ex uh, expansion and, and, see, and see if it fits. And that actually does give you some constraints, but they're, they're terribly uh, uh, weak, weak constraints. So what I would claim is, given the fact that uh, we know one component of velocity from the radial velocities, that, that they're fine. The proper motion velocities are going to be an underestimate because we've, we've taken out the expansion. We really don't know the virial state of the ONC, and we don't know whether it's expanding or collapsing. So Gaia, of course, will, will clarify that. And then another uh, place where it's been fruitful to do a detailed uh, uh, kinematic study uh, is Eta Char, which is right at the other end of the uh, spectrum of, 
a richness of, of nearby star forming regions. So it's only got 18 systems. And again, I was saying, you, got, you need to have a question in mind when you do a dynamical uh, model. And the question that was brought to mind looking at Eta Char was the IMF seemed a bit weird in it. And a bit weird means that you've got four stars greater than one and a half solar masses, but no stars down at the sort of 0.1 solar mass uh, N. Now, maybe the lower end of the IMF is all up in the air anyway, but it's still legitimate to ask the question, can you start with a kind of more orthodox view of the, of the IMF and just appeal to dynamical evolution to get rid of your low mass stars? Remember that the low mass stars tend to get kicked out preferentially in the beginning of a dissolution of, of a cluster. And so this is the uh, very recent work of Christoph Becker and uh, collaborators doing uh, sort of Monte Carlo uh, n-body simulations to see whether there's any way you can start with a normal IMF with any kind of initial configuration and by the age of Eta Char, see what you actually see. And the answer is a no, you can't. Um, simply that to get rid of all the uh, brown dwarfs, you'd have also dispersed the more massive stars to larger radii. It, it, the, the spatial distributions uh, don't work, but uh, several of the authors of that paper in this room, you can uh, ask them about it. OK, so that was just the, the, the first of my uh, three topics. The second one is that uh, if, as I've tried to argue both from observations and from the simulations, cluster formation is a hierarchical process, then in a sense, every star probably formed in a cluster of some sort, even though it wasn't in it for very long and it might have been a very unimpressive low-end uh, cluster. And by the way, Bob was quite right. Sorry for muddying the waters yesterday. It's absolutely true that there's an equal probability of uh, a, you know, a, a random star you take in the field coming from any logarithmic bin of cluster richness uh, if you have that m to the minus 2 uh, cluster mass slope. The question I want to ask there is, are there properties that stars take around with them for the rest of their lives that bear witness to the fact that they were born uh, in a cluster? And particularly, can we infer something about the required mix of clusters of high and low density, etc., that are required in order to synthesize the field? And one of the things which has become known as the IGMF concept um, it, uh, I want to um, touch on uh, briefly. OK, so uh, this is probably where I move to the blackboard again. Uh, IGMF is the Integrated Galactic IMF. Um, it's been promoted very vigorously by Pavel Krupa uh, and his group, and there's a wide variety of views about its uh, uh, validity. I'm going to give you my take on it. But if Pavel was in the room, he would certainly disagree strongly. So just bear in mind that although this, although this is a school, you know, I'm going to show where I'm, I'm, I'm biased. And by the way, I'm not saying that I think it's a stupid idea. I'm just saying I don't think it's borne out by, by, by the data. Let me tell you what it is. Um, supposing we think that the upper end of the IMF is, a, say, a Solpeter function, and I sample stars. So this is a probability function. And I sample stars in a cluster. Um, and then I do that repetitively um, and just sort of collect up bags of stars and I do that for lots of different sizes of, of cluster, lots of different ends. And then I do that all randomly and I put all my clusters together. What will the resultant IMF be? Well, it will just be dysfunction, right? You haven't, you haven't changed anything by doing your exercise in, in separate uh, bags. However, supposing you do this exercise and introduce a subtle difference to it, you actually say, OK, every IMF in a cluster, I'm still picking basically from, say, a Solpeter slope on that cluster, but I have a truncation at the upper end of that which depends on the mass of the cluster that I'm looking at. And this has to be a systematic truncation. It can't just be the fact that if you're pulling out things from the probability density function less times than on average, you're going to not get so high up in the IMF. That was the scenario I was talking about before. And that doesn't make any difference to the integrated IMF when you put all the clusters together. But if you're systematically in a lower mass cluster, occasionally throwing things back for some reason when you're doing your, your sampling exercise, then what you're doing, coming back to this plot, is that when you put your field together from all these clusters, all these little trun truncated IMFs in clusters of different richness, when you add them up, the integral, 
is a steeper function or can be a steeper function than the individual cluster IMFs. And so Pavel's point was that you may think that you've measured an IMF fine in a particular cluster. You probably wouldn't notice the fact that it was truncated because you assumed you just ran out of stars because, you know, finite sampling effects. But that when you put it all together, you might find that your cluster, your integrated galactic IMF is much steeper than what you've been dealing with. And why this is important, I think it was Neil on the first day was saying that virtually everything we know about star formation and you know, the universe on a larger scale is based on high mass stars and you just extrapolate to low mass stars. So knowing the slope of that extrapolation is really, really um, uh, uh, important. And you know, there are a number of uh, papers arguing both for and against the concept that the integrated galactic IMF is indeed steeper than than, than saltpeter. Uh, I think it's very, very hard to argue that one way or the other on a galactic scale, actually, because it, there's so many uncertainties in that. You can always fix most problems by changing the IMF or changing a number of other parameters. So um, I think for this to be, to, to, to claim that this is an important effect, you actually have to demonstrate on the basis of the clusters themselves that there's a truncation in the IMF. And if you've demonstrated that, then the implication is yes, there's this important effect for the IGMF, but you can't just uh, um, go straight to uh, uh, extragalactic regions, I think. That, 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 that's my take. I think we need to look at the, the, the clusters. And a little um, thing on this is that even if you do have this truncation effect, whether it's actually manifest when you add up all these clusters of different richness together does depend on the steepness of the cluster mass function. Uh, so, in fact, uh, as long as it's your cluster mass function is steeper than 2, you do get the steepening of the integrated IMF. And the reason for that is then you've got more small clusters, and therefore the fact that they're truncated actually makes a difference to the integrated whole. But for m to the minus 2 or shallower, it actually doesn't make any difference. You can actually show all this uh, analytically. And again, we know that the slope is minus 2-ish. So... That, 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 that's, that's a further uh, complication. But um, coming back to the question, or coming back to the issue of looking in, I was going to say, well-studied local clusters. They're not, as, as you'll see, they're not actually that, that well-studied, um, but probably well-studied compared with extragalactic systems. Can we actually see an empirical evidence that these clusters, you, you're truncating the distribution from which you're, you're picking your stars? And to test that, you need to look at the null hypothesis and assume that you're not truncating it and see whether your data is consistent with that. So here's an exercise. You have a universal IMF. It's not truncated. You pick 30 stars from that distribution. And each time you do it, you record the mass of the most ma massive star. And you do that repetitively, and you build up a probability distribution. And you can write it down analytically, or you can compute it. This is the case of 30. And then you take a given cluster with 30 stars and you see where its particular maximum mass is and you see where it lies on that distribution. But beware, it's a very skewed distribution. So there's a great problem, by the way, with working with the expectation value of that um, distribution because the expectation value tells you what's what you expect to get, but actually that's not really the way you should think about an expectation value because where the median is much less than the mean, it means that most of the time, when you sample 30 star clusters, even under the null hypothesis, the maximum mass should be much less than the expectation. The reason that you get that higher expectation value is that just occasionally you'll get an outlier on this side. So what you really need to do is to, at a given richness of cluster, sample the maximum masses that you see observationally and see whether they're consistent with this uh, distribution. And Thomas and I uh, tr tried to do this. There we are. Um, and actually, this, this plot is quite interesting. I'll return to it at the end when we talk about the birthplace of the solar system, quite regardless of IGMF issues. So it's just a compilation from the literature of the log of the number of stars in the cluster and literature values of the maximum mass in that uh, maximum mass star in that cluster. Uh, and if you can't read it at the back, that's 10, 100, 1,000 stars. Um, and this is 10 solar masses. And uh, there probably should be error bars in the vertical direction, but there are particularly error bars in the horizontal direction, which are one-sided error bars, because what you're doing is 
you're counting the stars that are accompanying this most massive star, and if you're incomplete, which you probably are, then you've underestimated n, and therefore you go off in this direction. And this is a, this is a completely arbitrary factor two uh, uh, error bar that's been applied uh, to every uh, to every data point. Uh, it's just there for it just just there to uh, caution uh, the uh, uh, the reader that actually things should shift right in this plot. And then this is the distribution based on random drawing. And the IGMF concept requires that your maximum masses are low down systematically on the centiles of this distribution because there's something physically which is restricting the maximum mass. You, you're probably saying, but hang on, of course you must restrict the maximum mass because you've only got a finite reservoir of gas. And that's true. And Pavel has done a number of Monte Carlo simulations where he just puts in that constraint. He just says, I pick cluster masses according to this distribution. And then when I populate them with stars, I don't allow the total mass to exceed the total reservoir I'm um, getting uh, stars out of. But in fact, if you apply that, that you don't get indetectable IGMF effects. So he actually has to apply a sort of artificial stronger constraint on when he um, uh, assembles his clusters in order to actually get a, 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 a meaningful effect. So as I say, it's completely consistent with the data. The data and the null hypothesis are completely consistent. And if anything, at least down here, things are lying rather high up on the centiles of that distribution. I do caution the fact that these points should move over. This is a um, collection uh, Leonardo Testi and collaborators uh, looking at massive stars and trying to go as deep as they could in the infrared to look at the census of low mass stars that, are, that accompanied them. But it is just notable that you've got quite massive stars, you know, B stars, etc., which are in um, clusters of, you know, apparently numbering only 10 or a few tens of, of, of stars, which is very different from the mindset you have if you merely work with the canonical mean of the, of the distribution. And Weidner and Cooper do claim that if you go up to high enough cluster masses, you do see the effect. But I really worry because there's another effect that can start pruning down the maximum mass you observe in a cluster, and that's stellar evolution. So you really have to know the age of your cluster very accurately to make sure that the most massive members haven't simply gone uh, off the, the main sequence and disappeared from your sensor. So I'm a bit suspicious if you're only starting to see these effects up in the region where you're not quite sure whether you've lost some of your stars or, already. But uh, um, certainly at the, lo at the lower masses where you can be fairly confident that the stars wouldn't have evolved, I don't think there's any evidence for it. Now, if you really wanted to push it, the thing to do would not be to just take one data point for every cluster that you have. You're throwing away an awful lot of data. It would be to look at individual clusters and test whether, if you look at the high end of the IMF, you really are just randomly sampling from a saltpeter, and therefore your highest data point is just due to random sampling, or whether it's truncated, and looking at that on the basis of all the data on the upper tail of the IMF. And as I mentioned before, you then have to use the right statistical test to figure out whether your data requires a truncation. Um, I think the reason why it's probably not a good idea to go down that way is how well do we actually know the masses that we're putting in. You can use a lot of sophisticated statistics, but if you don't know the masses that well on the upper IMF, maybe you shouldn't be, be doing that. So I, I think it was, a, it was an interesting idea. I, I don't believe it because of the data, um, but as I say, just be aware that uh, we are in the, the realm of controversy, and if Pavel was here, he'd be telling you something very, very different. So, um, going on to the um, imprints that clusters make on the stars that they produce. So that was about the, the, the IMF. What about the effect it has on trying to form planets and having disks in the early stages of a, of a star's life? So we're back in the ONC again here, and this is the most beautiful direct evidence that disks exist. Um, and these are the <coughs> famous silhouette disks uh, in the ONC. Um, so the first thing is that yeah, disc, discs exist. Uh, they're on the near side. They're seen as, as the dark patches in silhouette against the bright nebula. But I don't so much here want to draw your attention to the discs themselves, which are the, the black bits, but um, to these sort of uh, whitish tadpoles here. And the tadpoles are called propylids. Um, and they're explained very nicely as being the result of photoevaporation, which is driven by the most massive star in uh, the ONC, uh, Theta-1c Orionis, down in the centre, 50 solar mass star, 
It's got a strong far ultraviolet flux, which is driving a, essentially a neutral wind off the disc. And what you're seeing is this bright rim around your proclid is the intersection of the ionizing photons from that star with the neutral wind. It's all been beautifully modeled by Hollenbach and uh, collaborators. And um, it's, uh, it's a situation where you can both work out theoretically what you expect the mass loss rate to be as a result of this, this neutral wind. And you can also measure it directly through radio free free emission um, and also through uh, spectral line diagnostics. Um, but theoretically, to drive such winds, you need a really strong um, far ultraviolet field. So the, the theoretical cutoff for driving these winds is a, um, a Harbing UV field of 50,000. So that's just normalized to the value of the far UV ambient field in the solar neighborhood is one. So this is 50,000 times that is required in order to get these uh, winds. And then you ask, well, where so that, is that fulfilled in Orion? And it's within 0.3 parsecs of the center. And then you ask, what's the spatial distribution of where you see the, the proclids? And of course, you've got projection effects to take into account. But actually, basically, where you see the proclids in the cluster is quite consistent with that story. Now, what's worrying about this is that I said you, you could nicely constrain the mass loss rates, and they're huge. 10 to the minus 7 solar masses a year. Um, anybody who works in this field knows that this is humongous because it means that over the lifetime of the Orion Nebula cluster, a star that was exposed to that mass loss rate, its disk would lose one solar mass. Now, the stars in Orion are less than a solar mass to start off with, most of them, and their disks are considerably less massive than the stars. We've got some millimeter measurements of that. So there's no way that these can have been sitting in that roasting environment over the age of the Orion Nebula cluster. So also some suggestion that maybe if you invoke radial orbits, you can get around that. So you're a star that spends most of its time out at the edge of the cluster. It falls in uh, on a radial orbit, visits the, the centre where the uh, ultraviolet field is, is strong, lights up as a proplid, but then goes out for safety for most of its life. It's a nice idea, but uh, we weren't able to find any uh, dynamical model of uh, Orion that could actually do that. So we just set up n-body models with different assumptions and just tagged the dosage of far UV that each star would get. Um, and it, unfortunately, that didn't work. So since this is a, an observational rather than a theoretical um, result uh, that you're, you're losing this prodigious amount of, of mass, uh, you're left with the, the sense that we must really be looking at the uh, Orion Nebula at a rather special moment, because if you look at the measured disk masses and the measured mass loss rates, then um, it should only, these disks should only live for perhaps another 10 to the 5 years or so from, from now. Um, and so this was compatible with the fact that proplids have hardly been found in any other clusters. It's looking at the Orion in a, in a special moment, but it also means that these disks were only exposed to theta 1c fairly recently, 10 to the 5 years ago or so. It doesn't mean to say that necessarily theta 1c was born only 10 to the 5 years ago. It could just mean that the optical depth got low enough for the disks to actually be exposed to that 10 to the 5 years ago. But they, they can't have been in, in it for long. Um, now, from the point of view of deciding on you know, which stars should have planets and how that relates to a cluster origin, it means that if you were born in the inner 0.3 parsecs of the Orion Nebula cluster, there's no way that you'd be able to form a planet unless you'd managed to form your planet before you got exposed to the ionizing, well, it's not the ionizing, the, the ultraviolet uh, radiation. But this is a rather extreme uh, condition, the uh, core of the Orion Nebula cluster. If you do a kind of population synthesis type exercise, so say clusters are born with a whole spectrum of richnesses, whole spectrum of radii masses, etc refer you to this nice work by Fatuzzo and Adams uh, on this. Uh, when they went through this whole, this whole exercise, they thought that actually for your average star, its exposure to far ultraviolet radiation during its first million or so years, due to this effect, would be pretty low. And the, the statement is, less than a quarter of the stars in the solar neighbourhood were born in environments where their disks would have been pruned down, stripped away by the ultraviolet, to 30 astronomical units, which is uh, the sort of Kuiper belt type uh, distance, um, by photo evaporation in 10 mega years. So for some stars, 
it's a very cataclysmic thing if we're born in the core of the Orion Nebula cluster. But averaged over the population, it's probably not an, an enormous uh, effect. What about the imp imprint on the disks or the capacity to, to make planets based on dynamical pruning um, of uh, uh, disks in clusters? So a uh, whole, whole suite of work, Jim Prinkle and I were working on that uh, gosh, 20 years ago now, and uh, a lot of people have worked on it since, figuring out if you have a stellar flyby around a disk, what happens? So here's a star with a disk, and a star comes, another star comes by, what happens to the disk? And a good rule of thumb is that the disk gets stripped down to about 50% of the pericenter distance between the stars during that flyby. Of course it depends on mass ratio, of course it depends on velocity, of course it depends on inclination. But as I say, this has been very exhaustively uh, 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 investigated. And if you just want a rule of thumb for sort of average, say that a disk gets disturbed if something goes past it at less than twice its, its radius. So then we can go to a dynamical model of uh, the ONC. And again, this is... Uh, uh, Elvin Scully's thesis work, um, and uh, just say, sit on a star in the ONC and record the closest encounter it ever has over a given time scale with another star in the cluster. And you certainly won't be able to see this at the uh, end, end of the room. This was the situation in the ONC right now. So you evolve your ONC model to an age of two million years. You make a variety of assumptions about the dynamical state in which it was born, but having got a, having got a given model, you, you run it, and then you log at the end, at the end of your two million years, how close it got to another star versus to where it is in the cluster now. And uh, by the way, the laser pointer seems to have given out, so uh, um, uh, there's, no, there's no stick, maybe. No, OK. Perhaps we should. That would be good, yeah. Um, but uh, the, the point is that close encounters down at disk scales are really only happening to relatively few stars in the core of the uh, uh, Orion nebular cluster. So it does happen, but it's not going to be a terribly... Oh, brilliant, thank you. That's great. So it's not going to be a terribly um, major uh, effect. And you... Horizontal or vertical? Both, both, yeah. <laughs> one parsec, two parsecs, three parsecs, 10 AU, 100 AU, 1,000 AU. So sort of disky type things are these guys there. Of course, they're down in the centre. You know, they're, they're, they're a rather small fraction of the points. Of course, you could say, well, that was at 2 million years. What happens if you run it on? So we did run it on for, for 10 million years. But uh, because actually um, the ONC has to expand a bit from its present configuration, because actually um, it, it, it isn't completely in dynamic equilibrium, even if you don't uh, expel any gas, you don't actually get that many more close encounters by, by 10 m million years than you do uh, right now. So I don't think probably there are going to be that many close interactions in the ONC. So I did want to say this, because I think this is a very cool topic, and a lo lovely review by Fred Adams on this a couple of years ago. It's, it's, it's just fun. It's just saying, what are the constraints on what sort of cluster environment the sun might have been born in? And a strong constraint is we know the planet's orbits are pretty close to circular and virtually uh, coplanar, so that's an argument for being born in an isolated place. But then there's this uh, important chemical constraint is that meteoritic samples contain elements that are daughter products of short-lived radionuclides such as iron-60. And so what that means is because these nuclides don't live very long, of order of a million years or so, you have to have a source of these nucleides which was then incorporated in the meteorites and then produced the, uh, the daughter products which we now see uh, in situ. But there has to have been a source of this, uh, um, of this being produced in the solar neighbourhood within a million years or so of the meteorites uh, forming. And so whereas this argument is for isolation, this argument argues for the fact that you're close to uh, a supernova. And uh, you can ask... Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I, yeah. If it was yeah. not yeah. in isolation mm. and... You know, your, yes, your disks might be truncated, but if they're truncated to, say, 30 mm. AU or something, you could still get a planet forming close in 
I mean, the oh. fact that it's formed in a disk will mean that the planets yeah. will, even if they were inclined, they yeah. would probably be, um, their inclination would probably be done. So could you not then still get a planet, that, could you not still get, you know, planets forming around the sun uh, in a, you know, the, in a denser environment or something, or perhaps it could have been born in a denser environment. I'm just not sure that the first argument is necessarily a, a constraint. I can see from the second argument, yeah, that that would... That Sorry, we, we, the arguments here, or the... Yeah, on the previous page. On the previous it's not about planets or sure. no planets. I think it's about our solar system. Yes, it's specifically about our solar system, because, of course, when you've got very eccentric planets, which you, which you do have, then, of course... Uh, you don't know about them, but our solar system is very close to being coplanar and e e eccentric. So <coughs> once these planets formed, once they'd formed, then you can't have, when the gas is gone, then you can't have a... Yes? Okay, yes. For the mention of bias supernova, yeah. uh, at what stage yeah. would that have to happen? Would that have yeah. to happen before, uh, before the uh, solar system starts to form, or could you already have a Yeah, as, long as, as, long as, as long as you haven't assembled your meteoritic material, um, then... So I, I think you need, you need a supernova to have gone off within a million years of the, the birth of the, of the sun. OK. That's the, that's, that's the claim. Because let, 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 I'm rather out of time, let, let's, let, let, let's revisit that, uh, 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 actually. Um, Neil's also going to talk about that. Great. This topic, yeah. This topic. Okay. Paper, so. oh, you're going to review Fred's paper too. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. So may, maybe I can go quite um, hurriedly over this. Although I mean, it does relate back to these simulations we've done. We can relate it to Orion. So maybe I, I, I will uh, say this. So the question is, if you want to create a solar system um, like our own and leave it undisturbed, leave the eccentricities and inclinations low. Um, you mustn't have an encounter within about 200 AU. And if you look at our uh, Orion Nebula cluster simulations and ask what fraction of stars had avoided such an encounter, then the answer is 90% of them would have done so. So it's not very constraining. So it's fine from that point of view for the sun to have been born in the Orion Nebula cluster. But now there's a different question. This isn't about survival. This is actually about saying, are there properties of the solar system that we can actually use a flyby to ex explain. And the Kuiper belt here, so this is a sort of the, the rocky rubble outside the gas giant planets, you can see it's got a very sharp edge at about 50 AU. Um, and a number of authors have suggested that you might in induce that by a flyby. So how close does the flyby need to be in order to get a sharp edge? And the answer is about two to 300 AU. Now, from my perspective, that's a bit close to the 200 AU at which you start scrambling up the planets. Um, but uh, I don't know. Um, on the other hand, another feature you might want to uh, invoke flybys for is Sedna's got a weird orbit. It's got a pericenter of 76 AU, so that places it well outside where most of the uh, other bodies of comparable size in the solar system discovered so far reside. Uh, it's, so it's not just that it goes out much further on an eccentric orbit, its pericenter is much further out. And so the idea is something external has stirred up the system and um, lifted it out to a pericenter of 76 AU. So how close an encounter do you need to that? Well, that's a bit more generous, 400 to 800 AU. And what fraction of stars in the ONC had that sort of uh, encounter after 10 mega years? Well, the answer is about 25%. So the ONC would have been a fine environment for um, promoting Sedna. And I, I won't, I'm, I'm sure um, uh, Neil will do a better job on this than me, but I just want to say a few things about what is required in terms of the progenitor supernova to be able to uh, explain the radionuclide uh, data. Very much not an expert in this area, but the progenitor mass has to be apparently about 25 solar masses and it needs to have gone off within 0.2 parsecs of the sun because you know the yield of your supernova and so you know what solid angle your disk subtends in order that it soaks up this uh, uh, material, which is probably part of the answer to your question, that it still has to be, you still have to have a protoplanetary disk there when the supernova 
uh, goes off because uh, uh, otherwise you don't, you don't soak up the uh, uh, ejector. Um, but of course, if you have your supernova going off too far, too close to your uh, disk, then you just strip off the, uh, the disk. So actually, again, this is maybe an uncomfortable uh, uh, range. Uh, and by the way, if you worry about having a 25 solar mass star um, that distance from you, would it, before it went supernova, have fried the disk anyway? Hello? Could you increase that distance if it mm. went off during the photosummer phase? Yeah. yeah. Like oh, you mean out, out at 10 to the 4 AU? But no, the 0 0.2 parsec, so yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah, so yes. Oh, that's an interesting uh, uh, question, because uh, as long as you could get it into the meteorite within uh, 10 to the 6 years, which maybe you could, yeah, given the free fall time of a class 0 object. So, yes, that's, that's interesting, yeah, yeah. Um, I'd be interested to hear know what, what Fred said about that, but it seems interest, interesting to me. Um, as I say, do you have to worry about the, this star before it went supernova, um, blasting away um, the disk where the UV field? No, you don't. You're well below that critical um, UV um, field at which you fry disks. And I'm getting very close to the end. So um, I think there are many environments that can provide a supernova nearby and also not to perturb the solar system too much. So the ONC works well from that point of view, as long as it wasn't in the inner 0.3 parsecs where its disk would have got, got fried by theta 1c. But uh, in, in, you know, if it was, most of the stars aren't in that in, inner region. So the outskirts of the ONC would have been just, just fine for the, um, uh, for the, for the sun. Um, Fred tries to get, be quite prescriptive, well, I mean, reasonably prescriptive. He actually says you can constrain the, the birth aggregate maybe to 1,000 to 10,000 solar masses, saying that you need a cluster of that kind of richness in order to be able to uh, expect to have that 25 solar mass star in it. But this is where I bring you back to this diagram. Sure, there's incompleteness here, but it does seem as though there's some quite sparse clusters which do have stars in that kind of uh, mass range. So I think there's probably a whole variety of different places the sun could have been born which, which would, be, would be fine for it. And the recap, I'm just going to leave up there if you want to make any notes. And I am done. Thank you. Thank you.